Okay, welcome and thank you for coming to the uh, State Government GIS Users Committee Enlightening Round. We have a lot of state agencies up here doing some amazing work with GIS. You're going to get a little taste of the many ways that it's being used across state government. So we're going to jump in real quick. They've got five minutes to talk, so this will be very quick. First up, we have Todd Meyer with NCDOT. All right, I'm, uh, I'm with NCDOT Rail Division. NCDOT is a big place, so if anybody, if you're going to ask me about somebody at NCDOT, you know, we've got 10,000 people, I probably don't know them. But I'm Todd Meyer. I'm the data, uh, data analysis inventory manager with the Rail Division. Um, I'll go over a little bit of Rail Division. We, we're one of four non-highway modes in DOT. Uh, we cover all rail projects that involve state-maintained roads, um, coordinate with local governments for municipal streets, and we facilitate uh, funding for corridor projects with railroads through grant funding. And there's many business units and branches in the rail division, and we sit under the engineering coordination and safety branch. So our team is responsible for all the rail data uh, for the rail division. Uh, we notable, some notable items are our inventory field assessments. We do QA, QC of our crossing records, and we are the GI's presence for the rail division. You'll see in here a lot of acronyms and terminology from coming out of my mouth, but uh, I'll. Uh, first, uh, first thing I understand is Sarah wasn't something named after my wife. Uh, it's an application, a database that was named after Sarah Smith. She was the first to actually create a state spreadsheet that started tracking rail crossings for rail, for rail division. Uh, the state has two large railroad class one companies, that's NS and CSX, and there's approximately about 26 short lines that also operate in North Carolina. Uh, and note today when I mention LRS, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the NCDOT highway LRS and not a rail LRS that I'm responsible for that doesn't exist. So, you know, as I said, we're the owner and maintainer of SARE application. It holds crossing data. It's also responsible for managing project data for signals, uh, traffic separation studies, and uh, closure projects. Uh, we have about 3,700 public at grade crossings that we inspect on a three-year cycle. So that's about 1,200 a year. Um, we update FRA database with our state agency updates. So when we do our field assessments, we are pushing state data to the FRA national database through our account. But there's also short line. We're also, for some of the short lines in North Carolina, we're delegated authority for their railroad accounts. So we're putting their, we, we get, we ingest our railroad data and we push that up through their railroad account because we don't have the access to the state agency update. Um, we also track additional data pertaining to crashes and crossing and trespasser incidents. This includes injuries and fatalities that occur outside the crossing. Um, we also do special projects uh, for the division, for leadership um, within the division so we can handle like the data analysis, reporting and mapping for their request. So now let's talk a little bit GIS. Um, our current public facing GIS presence includes three, three layers. It's the rail lines, facilities, and crossings. Uh, the, the rail lines and the, and, the, and the facilities are managed through continual observation. So we don't have any workflow that tells us when these things change. We sometimes, we're observing, um, you, know, uh, you know, staying aware of projects that add lines, rail abandonments that take away lines, and maybe ribbon cuttings that add facilities or add, you know, once the rail facility comes aboard, we can add it. Uh, we also use our aerial photography uh, annually to make sure that we've caught everything. The published uh, crossing layer includes grade highway and pedestrian public crossings, but it also includes uh, grade separating crossings. And I've included QR codes, so and when this is published, you've got quick access to it if you're interested in seeing more. So now internally, we go a step further. We're using dashboards to track our inventory cycle pro, uh, status. Uh, we use a web app and using a bunch of layers, like for instance, our LRS, our road characteristics layer to see if route numbers, names, or, and ownership has changed. Uh, we're also integrating unstructured data, like uh, photographs that we take at our crossings 
they are stored on a server and have a service, and our GIS uh, feature layer points to those. Uh, we're also going to be looking to house other documents possibly in the future, which could be from our archive, you know, our, our paper archive, or you know, maybe things that we can collect from the railroad. <clears throat> now, I'd like to recognize all of this is being done manually on a weekly basis. Right now, we're, this is not autonomous. So, what are we doing, what we consider innovative? Uh, we're in the process of integrating SARA with our GIS feature service to end this manual process of moving data. Uh, to complete our inventory field assessment, you know, we then use mobile apps that complete our inventory field assessments and manage the collected photographs. Uh, you like to find out more detail about this. We have a presentation at 2.30, Salem 3A. David and Chris Reichel and my team will be presenting in detail on that. Uh, no, last thing on this slide, we're, we're also using Quick Capture. So some, we had people go in the field, we're interested in get, getting data from them. We have field teams that go out on, on the construction side that go out on high rail. They actually drive the tracks. So Quick Capture, we didn't want to slow what they're doing down. So we, you know, implemented a Quick Capture form for them to take pictures, you know, track mile posts, and collect any data they saw in the field. And it's coming directly into our data layers. So what are we looking for next? Now we're looking at integrating with the LRS as well. We're gonna be placing our crossings as events in the LRS so that we can get highway and mile post, route ID data, public versus, you know, identify public versus private based on roads, uh, local and state maintained, and route classification. All the less GIS related, you know, we're also looking at automated reports for us to, you know, expose changes to the data between the different data sets. So we are not the source of record for highway route characteristics. So, you know, we'll be looking for change in the LRS, FRA, some of the, you know, we don't manage all the railroad content, so we're gonna be looking at the national database to align with, you know, federal, uh, the, uh, some of the railroads, rail, like volume data. And this is all to help us more confident in managing our data internally in SARA. So, and looking to the future, you know, and I put that school bus there because I've worked with uh, the school bus routing system in North Carolina. Where they have a system that tracks, you know, buses across crossings. Okay. And, um, and this will be part of our project prioritization model currently and update our records. So that's it. Um, just the last thing on, I hope you learned something today. Uh, this one mentioned the blue sign. You should see this at every crossing. If you see something strange going on at any crossing, you should call that phone number and give them that ID. So thank you. I think we'll have time for one question while we're switching over. So does anybody have a question for Todd? I prefer the awkward tunnel. <laughs> All right, next we have Anna Stefanowitz from the Wildlife Resources Commission. And today I would like to talk to you about how our experiences with switching to field maps in our agency. Before that, I would like to say a few things about our agency. Uh, about 70% of our staff is located in the field. They work on variety of conservation management of wildlife resources projects and also the ones that the infrastructure that supports conservation and recreation. There are different ecosystem across the state and therefore the different conservation needs. These in turn create regional differences how data is captured, managed, reported and shared. Before field maps, uh, most of our field data collection was paper-based um, or internal centralized or localized databases that were not accessible in the field and required post-field work reporting data entry. The transition wasn't to field maps, wasn't linear. It was a back and forth two-way communication with field staff. First of all, on the GIS staff, uh, it was for the GIS staff, it was important to understand the subject of the project and the status quo uh, of the data structure of the collection processes, storage, sharing, 
what works and what doesn't uh, work in the current uh, status of um, the project and what are the goals and wish list of the staff that the current project might not uh, meet the staff needs. In the light of that uh, information, we needed to communicate with the staff what field maps could and could not offer and how actually they could have their work could be improved by using field maps. Um, there were, in many cases, there were several iterations of data structure and requirements, different designs and redesigns of forms and desktop web applications. And also we need to discuss what data to share and, and how to share the field data with the public. Uh, issues with uh, access to mobile devices and the internet service coverage and, uh, came up pretty quickly. Uh, we discovered our users had different levels of experience with mobile devices and applications, and these had to be addressed through training and instruction. So now moving back to the actual examples of the projects that we did. The first one that we applied field maps was for a project uh, regarding abandoned and derelict vessels. A few years ago, uh, our agency received funding and authority from the General Assembly to inspect, investigate, and remove ADVs associated with hurricane storms. This was um, a good example, a good pilot project for uh, starting a new technology such, such as field maps because there was no legacy data or no other existing systems that pre-existed field maps. So this app was um, created to uh, use, be used by the staff to capture and track the removal status of vessels identified as ADVs. We build in an arcade expression that generates on the fly sticker ID that then it's physically placed on a vessel identified as ADV. We also incorporated a, a Python notebook notifying the manager of a new site and status changes, which you can see in the right side uh, image of the different statuses. We also incorporated survey one to three for public submittals and that are subject to interval, internal review. If you'd like to hear more about these solutions, I encourage you to come tomorrow to 9.30 session for my colleague's presentation, how the, these tools were uh, um, integrated in field maps. Uh, in the past two years, over 270 ADVs were identified, over 50, 150 of them were removed. The, um, uh, another uh, example of our uh, field maps application is for buoys and navigational aid markers. We have the authority to establish uh, water safety rules to mitigate safety hazards. These are commonly known as no-way zones where vessels are required to travel at idling speed. So we, in relation to this program, we maintain uh, about 2,000 markers such as no wake buoys, danger, danger buoys, channel markers, mile markers. And these are now available through field maps for our staff to, uh, uh, to be accessible in the field and maintain on semi-annual basis. Um, as you've seen on the, the screenshot, screenshot, we added some uh, related hosted, hosted layers, such as no zones and boat ramps for, for the contextual information. And um, the, the previous project had a very positive feedback and the staff asked for more. Um, they, want, they also maintain water-related structures that they wanted to be able to access um, uh, through field maps. These are fish attractors. So these are structures underwater that create cover for fish. Um, and therefore, the, ex the experience for fishermen is enhanced because they con con congregate fish. And so this project is still ongoing. Uh, we have, uh, in our, we are in final stages of completing it and soon this will be made available to our staff and included in the um, application that we have developed for uh, finding fish, public fishing um, access throughout the state. So a few outcomes um, that definitely 
we uh, staff discovered field staff that there is less of almost no need for post field work data entry there's elimination of different submittal methods the improved data quality because of the established requirements on data submittal there's centralized centralized storage access to resources that are you can see across the whole state instead of regional regionally updates are easier quicker in instant and we can integrate now the the data with other AGOL resources and tools such as dashboards, and they do enhance the uh, transparency um, of what we do um, in our agency with the public. Thank you for your attention. Have you guys quantified how much time you've saved by doing this? No, we have not. <laughs> it sounds like you've saved a lot. <laughs> All right, next up we have Diane Enright with Department of Health and Human Services. Hello. Um, like Colleen said, I'm Diane Enright, and I work at uh, the North Carolina State Center for Health Statistics, which is part of the um, Division of Public Health. And we've used GIS for a long time, and I'm just going to have a few examples of what we do. Um, maybe. Um, so we look at things like the relationship between care providers and our population. So in this case, we're looking at school nurses to student ratios and where we have um, great, greater needs. Um, we might look at where vaccine distribution is happening and where we might need more or we might need less. That's become very, very important in recent times. Um, and then we might look at some things like treatment types for um, different types of diseases. Um, in this case, we're looking at cervical cancer and where surgery and radiation or um, where those things might be lacking. But um, if you saw my poster here at the conference, what we're starting to do um, in the next few months is look really closely at maternal and infant health. Um, it's a severe problem in the United States and in North Carolina. Although we're not the worst, we're not great. Um, it's very risky actually to give birth in the U.S. Um, for being such a Western industrialized country, you would think that would not be true, but it is. Um, so we're looking at both maternal mortality and of course, inf infant deaths. And so we're just looking, what we've done so far is just a high overview of what's happening in, in our state. My slides are not fancy. Here we go. Um, so we can look at things like just the number of births that occur in hospitals and how those relate to the urban and rural parts of our state. And those patterns become more apparent where lack of care is. The numbers may not be greater, but those events are still happening and we need to help all of our population and make sure services are provided. So here's um, infant mortality rates by county. So that's something we look at every year. We also look at disparity ratios, those between um, whites and African-Americans because it is greater in the African-American population. And we were trying to look at things as why, why that is. Um, so here's an example of what that ratio looks like. And then um, we started to look at where Um, where um, care can be provided for maternals. 
or mothers about to give birth. And this is a map of no labor or birth hospital by county in North Carolina. So you can see where there are absolutely none. And then we can also look at the number of health professionals. So here's where no maternal health professional by county is, and that includes uh, OBGYN doctor, an OBGYN physician assistant, or a certified nurse midwife. And if we look at those combined, we, it's what we call a maternity desert. So here's kind of overlay of both. And then we get a final picture of where maternity deserts are occurring. So in our future plans are to look at more distance to care um, because in the Northeast, there are hospitals just across the border in Norfolk and they're probably receiving some care there as well as other parts of our state that might be happening. But we wanna look at below the county level, look at where um, things like um, there's a specific program that's African-American doulas in Durham County who are speaking for African-American mothers and being their voice during labor and postpartum um, settings to make sure that they're receiving the care they get to help bridge that disparity ratio. And where else can we expand programs like that because it's been very successful. And so we wanna look at our resources and what other programs we could do to target and help um, save mothers and babies. So that's all. Thank you. Diane gets the award so far for the most spot on presentation because she was five minutes and three seconds. Good job. Okay, next we have Adam Blythe. <laughs> with the Department of Insurance and which one is yours? Which one is yours? Right there. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'm going to practice my auctioneer voice here. Try to get through this in five minutes. Um, okay. Um, I'm Adam Blythe. I work for the Department of Insurance, Office of State Fire Marshal. Um, I've worked there for about four years. I'm uh, Department of One, uh, the first GIS presence at that department. So quickly, I'm going to kind of go over. Um, let me, arrows, okay, good. I want to quickly go over kind of what NCDOI does and, and kind of how GIS has helped the department over the past couple of years. Um, if you're like me, before even before I worked here, I didn't quite know, quite sure what NCDOI did. But um, NCDOI approves insurance rate changes, um, investigates insurance fraud. We also have a seniors health insurance information program and the captive insurance regulation. Uh, Office of State Fire Marshal is a division within the Department of Insurance and. Uh, we oversee state building codes, um, secure property insurance for state-owned buildings. Uh, we also train, certify NC fire and rescue personnel. Uh, we have uh, community risk reduction falls within our department, like Safe Kids, if you've ever heard of that program. Uh, and we also provide fire ratings, insurance inspections, which is what I'm going to talk about this morning. That's where I'm the most heavily involved. Um, so I'm going to quickly go over what is a fire rating. So insurance companies use fire ratings to help set homeowners insurance rates. So a fire rating insurance uh, rating can calculate how well equipped fire departments are to put out fires in community. Uh, interesting fact, we are the only state in the country that has our own ratings inspectors. All other states, uh, insurance services office has their, their inspectors and I don't have the time to go into what ISO is, but uh, they basically came up with the ratings inspection program and they hold all the data. So we have nine ratings inspectors and OSFM rates all jurisdictions under 100,000 people. Uh, ISO does all the ones like Winston-Salem who are over 100,000. Uh, here's just a quick snapshot of what an ISO rating skill looks like. So um, 
the lower the rating, the better. And when you get a good rating, you know, I like to celebrate and the commissioner will come hang out at your fire department and uh, have a big party. So um, savings from like a class 10 to nine, just getting rated in the first place, you can save a homeowner on that section of your homeowner's insurance premium, 20%. Um, so you can see how if you, if it, the rating goes down, it's, it's uh, you know, you can save a lot more money. Uh, but less than 10, to, 10 years ago, uh, our department uh, for these ratings, uh, working with local jurisdictions, uh, they were using large paper maps supplied by the county and a map wheel. Um, anybody ever use one of those things out here? Yeah. Yeah, so to calculate mileages uh, from fire stations, um, you know, hydro percentages, all that was done on a big paper map. So now with the advent of network analysis tools, we can run these calculations a lot quicker. It used to take them, you know, a couple of days just to do the paper mapping portion of it. So now it's all done. Um, our office will, will do some of those reports and also ISO all does it through GIS and it saves a lot of time. Um, also with the inspectors, uh, when I got there, they were using a retired program, ArcGIS Explorer Desktop to, um, to view the fire flow information that they have to use on an inspection. Um, when they go to an inspection, they have to calculate, you know, that kind of like a little mock scenario where they'll take the Benton Convention Center and as a structure and they'll plot it on a map and then see how much water needs to flow um, in the case of a fire to this structure. So they were having to do all that in desktop, ArcGIS and Explorer desktop. So we built them some tools, um, a new fire flows application, which is um, an integrated uh, ArcGIS enterprise system um, for them to store and archive their data for NEC for the following inspections um, and, and also to um, be able to export that data out to ISO quickly. They were having to duplicate all those steps and send them into ISO. So now, thanks to GIS, um, you know, with GIS, thanks to GIS and those advancements in the Fireflows applications, um, we've been able to cut inspection time from 10 years to five years to revisit um, a fire station. So, um, and I will say a lot of this has been made possible through the efforts um, through NC1 map and all the data collection efforts across the state um, utilizes a lot of that data and to come up with something that quickly and efficiently wouldn't have been possible. So any questions or are we done? Yeah. We good? All right. Right. Next, we have John Cox with the State Property Office. Which one are you? Right there. Thank you. <laughs> I could just have you guys push them off. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm not a salesperson, and if you listen to the uh, keynote speaker for lunch, uh, you need to be a continuous learner in the GIS field. And just a little background. So my name is John Cox. I'm the FIS manager for State Property Office. So we buy, sell, and lease property. So all state agencies rely on us to buy property and lease property for them. So we own over a million acres. Uh, over 12,000 buildings. We lease, we have over 700 uh, office warehouse leases. So I started back in 1999 as a, as a manager, and uh, my first comment from my director is, I don't know what kind of magic you guys are doing back there, but I, I really like it. But uh, I said, well, it's, it's not magic. And uh, so we had a small staff back then, but over the next 10 years, I, I lost two staff, um, so which was not good. Uh, we were already understaffed, and uh, 
So I figured I'd, you better, I better start learning about how to sell this, this thing we're doing, this GIS thing. And uh, this has been my go-to thing. It's uh, from Arc News from a fall of 2016, Arc User magazine. And I, I, cut, I printed this thing out and I taped it to my wall. And uh, so I look at it every day. And so when my director or a deputy can, comes in and uh, they ask me a question, I think about these things and think about what they're thinking and how I could sell this thing we're doing uh, to them. So first, of course, on my list, these are things I've learned is even if you don't like them, you need to develop a good relationship with the management, no matter how they treat you, you know. And be ready to hear no. Um, I had a high official tell me, uh, who asked me what I needed, and I told them. And they told me, don't ask anymore. I said, oh, okay, I won't ask anymore. So time went on, and uh, we had additional legislative mandates come across uh, with no money attached to those. And so we had to learn, I learned, had to learn how to plead my case and uh, sell ourselves, our needs to the legislators and to, to secretaries and upper management. So well, my third, third on my list is have a, have a GIS app ready at all times. It's not one time, not twice, probably three or four times in my tenure here at State Property Office, my uh, deputy would come up and said, oh, I have a visitor coming by, I see you. Do you have uh, something cool to show them? I said, how much time do I have? 30 minutes. Okay, they're coming over in 30 minutes, so I have to have something ready to show them. I said, okay, I'll be ready. So, Next thing on my list was have a paper copy. So, I don't. So I'm 58. So there's a lot of generations out there in upper management. Some of them don't use computers still. They have computers at their desk, but they don't use them really. So you have to have something printed out so they can look at to display what you do. Right? Have it hang on your wall so they can see it when they come into your office. Right? And something else I learned. So we're, uh, uh, we have other uh, divisions within our department that never knew, never, that don't know what GIS is, but they know what maps are. So I ran in the hallway, uh, I met this uh, head of parking in the hallway, and I always joke with him. He always joke with me. He said, oh, he said, oh John, I got these paper maps. I said, uh, can you make them digital for me? And he would... I would meet him in the hallway at the elevator all the time. He said, I said, yeah, I could do that for you. Then finally he said, uh, well, what, what, what do you need from me? I said, oh, two, two interns, one summer. So we built the data set for him and of course put him online. They won an award that next year for that. Uh, but uh, So that's return on investment by investing in others. So finally, and then of course the last one, be a person of integrity. You want your management and everyone, all your users that you support to trust you. Thank you all very much. We have a demo at 3.30 if you want to see what we're doing. Thank you. I'm glad I'm giving you all an excuse to plug your other presentations. This is awesome. Learn here, learn more later. All right, next we have Mark Crook with NCDOT Division 9. Nope, that's not it. Sorry. Yeah, we use Faith and I use the same title slide. So. Oh. <laughs> uh, where'd we go? Go down here and see. Here we go. Okay. 
contract monitor. All right, there we go. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Mark Crook. I'm with uh, DOT based here in Winston-Salem, uh, part of our Division of Highways group. Uh, my background is in civil engineering, so to the GIS professionals in the room, I apologize. Um, I've got took an interest in GIS tools to sort of help solve problems. And this is one of the problems I have, I hope successfully solved for my division. Um, the talk, my talk today is about how we use field maps to monitor our uh, resurfacing projects. So every year, Division 9 lets about $35 million in contract pavement treatments. Um, those contracts are scattered across our five counties. They're multiple year contracts, so we always have some old work we're finishing up, new work we're starting. Um, kind of difficult to keep track of what's happening where. Uh, as you can imagine, we get a lot of calls in the office about the work we do. When uh, people see signs going up in their front yard or big machines chewing up the road, uh, they want to know what's going on. So we've developed this map and tool to uh, let our field inspectors uh, update uh, basically everyone in the division as to what's going on with these projects. And another benefit is it helps me monitor the cost on these projects. Uh, certain phases of work cost a lot more than others, and as they reach those milestones, it lets me know uh, they're getting ready to spend a lot of money. Um, the reason we chose field maps for this is our inspectors already have iPads that they were using to enter their diary information in SharePoint. So loading field maps onto that device uh, was an easy fit. So. You can kind of see on the map, these projects are scattered around all over our counties. On the left uh, is the list of milestones that we created. Um, it's by no means an exhaustive list, but it does kind of key in on when public, uh, when citizens see the work going on, take interest in it. And again, when the paving is complete, that's a big uh, financial milestone for the project. And then once the work is done and accepted, We've got symbology to, to show that to anybody that looks at this map. So again, symbology is there at the bottom, very simple. So my general workflow for this, um, our pavement management system can export a shapefile. So once I build our resurfacing contracts within that system, I just bring the shapefile into ArcGIS Pro and create my other fields for milestones and completion dates, that kind of thing. I then push it out to our GoMap platform, our AGOL platform, uh, build web maps off of that. From the field maps website, you can design the form that you want the folks in the field to use. The iPad app is literally just download, sign in, and search for the form you need to fill out. And as those inspectors are updating milestones and completion dates, two things happens. One, the web map is updated automatically. And thanks to the folks that manage our AGOA account with the GIS team in Raleigh, they're generating web, they use webhooks to generate emails. Um, so anytime somebody updates something, managers get an email that uh, there's been a change in status. Probably can't see that all that well, but the web map version, um, that's our whole division. If you zoom in and click on a road, the pop-up tells you the key uh, parameters about that. Uh, resurfacing map, who's responsible for it, project numbers, et cetera, and the status and the completion dates. This is the screen capture of what the inspectors see on their iPad. Of course, iPad can geolocate the inspector to the road they're actually working on so they don't have to pan around the map. That's handy. They select the road, go into the edit screen, and all they have to do is populate the uh, change in milestone and the date that that milestone was completed. This is just the sample email that's generated. Um, new for this year, they were able to incorporate some of the fields out of the table directly into the email. That's real nice. We can see just within the body of the email what contract, what map, and what the milestone was recently completed. Also built a dashboard. Um, 
that shows all the maps and all the contracts with the most recent change at the top. That just helps me uh, keep tabs on what I'm doing. And that's it. So, thank you. All right. Next, we have, I believe, Melanie Williams. Let me just check. No, we have Dan Matting. Just messing with you, Melanie. All right, Dan Matting with Emergency Management. So raise your hand if your community that you work in if it was involved in a flood, if you think you might be engaged in the response? Not many. How many would like to know how bad the flooding is going to be in your community if it's coming? A little bit more. For all of you that didn't raise your hands, you have four minutes and 38 seconds to go ahead and, and look at your screens. But um, anybody know this map? Anybody know what Atlas 14 is? It's probably the most important data set you've never heard of. Um, but basically, this map here comes from NOAA. And basically, um, this is a 24-hour period for a 100-year event. And so according to NOAA, North Carolina, 1% annually, should essentially get or could get the rainfall listed in the legend that you can't see all that well. Apologize for that. Um, but NCDOT, along with USDOT, they have actually funded updating this map. This map is not, this data set rather, has not been updated since 2004. And for those of you who have been in North Carolina since 2004, we've had a lot of big rain events in the last uh, 10 years. Um, and so what are we working on in North Carolina Emergency Management? So NOAA puts out a GIS data set called Quantitative Precipitation Forecast. And basically that's their best guess of how much rain is going to happen with a particular rain event. And so what we, North Carolina Emergency Management GIS, are working on is we're trying, to rain, we're trying to tie their rainfall predictions to essentially a flood reoccurrence interval. And so I apologize. I uh, try really hard not to put a lot of text on slides. But essentially, this is the process that we're going to go through when our meteorologists at EM, and we have three of them, when they tell us, hey, GIS, there's going to be a pretty significant rainfall, we're going to go run this routine to try to figure out what the flood reoccurrence interval looks like. And so this map on the left, this is what we refer to as a water surface elevation or depth grid, rather. And so basically at different intervals, in this case, a 1% annual chance, we're looking at how deep the water is going to be. And so that's kind of our, our end goal of, of what we're doing here. But basically the first step is we go out to the National Weather Service and we download their QPF data, again, the rain forecast, and then we kind of clip it to North Carolina. So in this particular case, this is what um, they're predicting to be rainfall for the next whatever period of time. And then so we basically, we rasterize that data and we convert it to points. And we essentially are populating that individual cell with the precip precipitation values. And so um, this is step sticks in that process. So at this point, we have a 90 foot grid and we're applying those values to that 90 foot grid. And so once we do all that, we actually, we are dissolving the grid to produce the QPF reoccurrence interval. So again, we can tell you for this 90 foot cell, what kind of rainfall the National Weather Service is predicting. And so ultimately what we're gonna do is we're gonna clip that to our water surface elevation rasters. And so essentially we're, we're, we're tying that back to the floodplain now. And so um, back in August of 2021, we weren't actually being in the loop on this, but we, we ran the process to try to predict for Tropical Storm Fred or to use the QPF to see what tropical, for, excuse me, tropical Storm Fred was going to look like. And so in this particular map here, um, this obviously is a river. It's obviously a river that had um, an additional flooding event beyond 1%. But basically here, we're looking at the depths of the water according to predicted rainfall in the different areas beyond or in the floodplain. And so 
kind of what we're looking at now is, is how accurate is this data? And so I'm no meteorologist by any stretch of the imagination, but predicting the rainfall with the level of accuracy that we need is super, super difficult. Um, but this again is for Tropical Storm Fred. And this, if you look here on the left, is the reoccurrence interval. And so um, pre-tropical storm rainfall, when we were looking at the QPF data, it was actually showing us that kind of eastern um, in southwest Buncombe County was going to get significant rainfall. And this is uh, QPE. This is their estimate or guesstimate of how much rain actually fell. And so we were actually telling our um, operations folks that eastern Buncombe County is going to be where they need to target. So now the big joke in my office is Dan's really bad at cardinal directions. If Dan says eastern County X, go to the county to the west of that, and that's where you need to go. I'd like to argue that it's actually the, the rainfall estimates, not Dan's problem, but um, nonetheless, I'm bad at cardinal directions, apparently. And so I wouldn't say um, from a predictive standpoint, the Trapple Storm Fred was, was a big success, but it was a, a very, very big learning experience. And so when we talk about QPF, it comes in different intervals. So it's essentially the next 24 hours or the next two days or the next three days or five days or seven days. And so, you know, y'all experienced our new tropical, or excuse me, Hurricane Ian was coming up the coast, going to hit North Carolina. And so, you know, seven days out, we were out there, we were downloading the QPF data, and we were trying to predict, is there any going to be any significant flooding? And then so, you know, when we got three days out, we took the three day out forecasts, and we did, you know, another analysis and didn't see anything real significant. And so that was good. So, the good news or the learning lesson there is the, obviously the QPF data, or the rainfall data gets much, much more accurate the shorter the interval, right? And so we learned that the 24-hour reoccurrence interval, or excuse me, the 24-hour QPF data is the data we want to use. And while that's great and it's good that we know that, the problem is that doesn't let us do a lot of pre-staging, right? I can't, it's, it's much more difficult for me to tell them, hey, you need to go to County X or County Y and stage when they have 24 hours to get there. Um, so where are we, North Carolina EM, heading, or at least the GIS department? So again, our meteorologists are going to be communicating to my group, hey, there's going to be a significant rain event. You need to be doing your analysis. And so in the next hurricane, what we're going to be trying to do is we're going to be trying to say, hey, County X or hey, County Y, we guesstimate this is going to be between a 50 and 100-year event, or we guesstimate for you it's going to be a 25 to 50-year event. And so... Right now, we're not going to like be publicizing that widely. Rather, we EM, we have branches, so we have a central, eastern, western branch, and each one of those branches have area coordinators that work with like five to six counties. And so GIS is going to be communicating to those area coordinators, hey, these counties of yours, we expect this to be the reoccurrence interval. And so ultimately, our goal is to be able to communicate ahead of time, this is the rainfall and the event that we expect, this is the range. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have Melanie Williams. Okay, I can't talk and log in at the same time, so you're going to have to give me two seconds. All right. I did not pay any attention to the 
Yes, we prepared the rest of the one. And while it's not great, it still gives me the best challenge. Because while they don't have any piece of the bottom county, you know, Eastern Paper County, good, I'm okay. So um, not the fault I think it's at 430, right? 2,000 spots. All right. Um, like Colleen said, my name is Melanie Williams. I'm with uh, Department of Environmental Quality and with the Division of Water Resources. And today you can talk a little bit more about the communication aspect of GIS rather than just some of the tech in general. So um, a lot of you may have seen already that we do, as a department, have our own open data page. Um, and this is great for us to be able to share all of our publicly available data to the public, get it out there, advertise it that way. But we also have a ton of internal data, internal applications. And this has been kind of very difficult to share internally. So you're trying to figure out other methods to be able to advertise what we do, advertise the products that we make, what's available internally to our folks, other than attach it to an email, put it in that link, ship it out to everyone. They go, oh, neat. Six months later, oh, I'd really like to get back to that application. That means I have to remember what email folder I put it in, and poof, it's gone, right? So our Division of Water Resources is, when fully staffed, about four or 500 employees we do a wide variety of things, anywhere from monitoring groundwater to surface water to permits to edu uh, environmental education. We do a large number of things. So when any one group comes to a whopping two of us that do GIS for our division and asks us to help them with anything, that's great. We can help them. We can create some of those products for them. But then no one else knows about it. Right? We get kind of siloed by accident. So what we've done is we've started pulling some of this stuff together, utilizing um, ArcGIS Online and utilizing our hub pages. So all of this is internal. We have to have a login to get to it. But it's kind of a one-stop shop for us to be able to show everyone within our division what we have going on. It's no longer just data. It's no longer just maps. It's now starting to expand out more into holistic workflows. So these can be anything from, you know, starting with collecting data from citizens to processing that through an email that goes to our staff to let them know that something needs to happen. Then our staff can interact with the public through a particular um, dashboard that we build for them and then the public can consume that data in a way that's easy for them through a public interface. So being able to see all of that kind of together, we've developed this hub page to where they can access pretty much anything that, that we have available to them, including public facing things that they may not know exists, but it has to do with something in water quality. So it's applications, it's data sets, but what we've started to realize more and more is that we also need to help folks understand that we have holistic projects out there. So this is one of the ones that um, follows that workflow that I just mentioned, where a citizen sees a dead fish or a group of dead fish or a giant algal bloom in the water, they're concerned about it, 
Um, we've had issues with this in the past in North Carolina where a dog went and drank some water out of lake, but there was toxic algal bloom going on at the time and the dog died. It was really bad. It was in the news. Well, how do we get that information out there to people? Um, so we do series of testing of water quality and things like that. So we now have this application where the public can make us aware of those things when they see it out there through a survey one, two, three application that they can fill out. As soon as they hit send, depending on where they are, it will send an email to that regional office letting them know that, hey, you might wanna go investigate this. So then the regional office staff has a link in that email where they can pull up the citizen problem manager and they can take a look at any of those reports that have occurred specifically the one that they were just that they just received once they get that they can take a look at it and say ah okay so we just had a fish tournament it is somebody just emptying out their bait bucket or okay this is actually a real problem we might need to investigate that so they can type all of that stuff up within the citizen um, problem manager and what that does is it goes directly into the data set that's in this dashboard. That was fast. Um, <laughs> and then the citizen can know what they're planning on doing as well as the staff can get to this investigation report, they can fill it out and they can ship it off to the person that reported to them. Um, so it's really helping us to kind of expand our communication within our own division, um, which has become really important. So um, communication, it's a good thing. Oh, in there. Who's next? All right. Thank you, Melanie. We now have Faith Johnson with NCDOT. Okay. All right, I'm Faith. Um, I'm with the Operations Program Management Unit at DOT, so we're part of Asset Management. And I just wanted to use this time to go over some of the uh, data that we have available in my group and in our unit. So um, DOT produces a ton of data, so I'm just gonna focus on what we have available. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, so everything I'm covering today is going to be available in one of two places. Uh, either Go and See, which is DOT's ArcGIS online platform, or the Road Characteristics file, um, which is the most detailed version of the DOT's linear referencing system, um, which is a big road file. It contains all the pu public road roads and private roads as well in the state, um, we update it quarterly. Um, you can find the GIS unit website if you just search for NCDOT GIS data. Uh, the first data set is mile markers. So these are just the signs on the side of the highways. Um, we are in the process of updating this data set. Uh, we're updating 700 miles right now and it'll be available this summer. This is the most widely used data set in Go and See for the department. It gets over 75 million requests a year. Um, that's because of all the applications it's used for, like crash locating and adopt a highway. Um, you can search for it in ArcGIS online. If you just look for NCDOT mile markers, make sure you use that two words for mile markers. Next one is highway exits. Really simple, just shows you where the highway exits are located. Um, has a highway exit number and name. This one is part of the road characteristics file. It's, a, it's actually a point feature class in that geodatabase. Um, my group has three uh, pipe inventory layers. These are in Go and C. Uh, the first one is called non-MBIS pipes, and this is the second largest class of pipes that DOT maintains. Um, these are pipes that are greater than 48 inches and in culverts, provided that they're less than 20 feet along the center line of the road. 
Um, anything larger than that is actually part of the national bridge inventory. So that's a, a separate class of pipes that's maintained by that data sets maintained by another unit. Um, but these are still pretty large pipes. They're mostly carrying live streams. Um, there's over 27,000 of these in the state. The next class of classification of pipes is maintenance pipes. Um, so these are pipes that are uh, less than or equal to 48 inches. Uh, both of these classifications of pipes, they light on both ends. So they're open on both ends. They're going underneath roads. We don't have driveway pipes. Um, there's over 350,000 maintenance pipes in the inventory. So there's a lot of these. And then the third class is storm drainage pipes. These are pipes that connect to boxes on both ends. We have very limited inventory of these. Most of them are in Cumberland County. Um, and we don't collect a lot of information on these. So this is just a partial inventory. Uh, you can find these in Go and See if you just search for NCDOT pipes. Um, so continuing on with the pipe inventory, um, we're in the maintenance phase of this cycle. So we reinspect these pipes on a five-year basis, so 20% every year. And we're collecting inventory and condition data and taking photos. Um, however, if you download or look at the public data set, you're only going to see the location, which is a linear feature. It's a line for the pipes. Um, you're not going to be able to send the inventory information. You're not going to get the condition information or the photos. You'll have to put in a, a request through me or through the um, public information request to get that data. Um, but you can see kind of on the right some of the information we have available in the, in the inventory. Um, we also, part of this program included collecting a statewide inventory of noise walls and retaining walls and inlets. So we have that data as well. Um, and just to note that I said we maintain like the second largest classification of pipes. If you search for NCDOT pipes, you'll get that other layer, which is the largest classification of pipes, the NBI structures. Um, and there's over 5,000 of those in the state. Um, just some other data that we have. So part of that road characteristics file, some of the other things we maintain, um, our ownership um, information. So we're tracking who maintains the road. And something we've been working on is non-system roads. Um, and we're trying to get full coverage of that across the state. We're relying on the Powellville maps, if any of you are with local government. I'd really like to improve our data stream for that. So if you guys have any um, data for that or any suggestions on to help me improve how to figure out who owns the road. Um, I would like help on that. And facility type, that's uh, a useful field for keeping track of, um, you know, we, we categorize like what type of road it is or whether or not it even is a road. So sometimes there's segments in the uh, file that aren't roads like driveways um, or roads on school properties or parks. So that can be used to filter other things out. Um, oh, one other thing on that was make sure you get this file called the Road Characteristics Field Descriptions document. That's going to help you um, figure out what all the different fields mean in road characteristics. And then lastly, this is just some other attributes that are maintained by our road inventory group in our unit. So there's a lot of good data in the road characteristics file. And that's all I have. I feel like I get asked all the time about uh, where DOT data is, so thank you for that. All right, so now we have Jacob and Colton. Mao. Mao. Okay. <laughs> is this you? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, my name is Jacob Mao. I work with Faith and the uh, Operations Program Management Group. Um, so I'm going to try to keep it quick since the whole point of this is to help you save time if you're duplicating any smart form uh, uses in field maps. So um, many of you are probably familiar with the smart forms. They are, they're introducing new uh, aspects to it. Seems every every quarterly update. Um, they've introduced arcade expressions, have you do calculated fields, conditional visibility. I think there's a way to do conditional uh, editability now, um, can make things read only. Uh, but with every new thing they introduce, 
uh, it's more time consuming to introduce those things into your form. So the more powerful you want to make your form, uh, the more work it takes. Um, as Faith said, uh, we capture a lot of data as part of our, our section. Um, and with such a huge size of data, we have to break it out by division, by DOT division. So we basically have 14 different identical maps, one for each division, 14 identical data sets. Um, and so since we're collecting data in all those maps, that that results in is a bunch of identical forms. Um, so each, each map has 11 forms with hundreds of RK expressions in them, calculated values for pipe condition, um, pulling your county division stuff to make sure that the users in the field don't have to type in division 12 every single time they open a form. Um, so there's a, a bunch of logic that goes into that and it's really time consuming to create a bunch of different forms and even more so to do it 14 times. So one solution that we found is, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the ArcGIS Online Assistant. Um, kind of lets you get into your organization and look at some more details behind the scenes on your various maps or features. Um, you can just log in with your AGOL login. And so what we found is you can actually extract and copy out form information from one map and just paste it into every single other map. And so it used to take an hour to build a form and 14 hours then to do it for every single division is now what you only have to do one time and then you can simply copy and paste it into every other map you have. Um, so basically what you do, you just go in, say I want to view an item's JSON. Um, there's two different boxes. There's just a description box and then there's a data box for your map. Um, and if you scroll down, there's a um, form info, which is basically just stores all of that information for when you're building your smart form. Um, you can simply just copy that out. Um, if you click edit, it will give you a little warning, um, but you can scroll down, just grab that form info section, um, that little dictionary that it has built, copy and paste into a text editor or something, and then go into your next map and you can simply edit that maps JSON, put it in right underneath the, um, in the same exact place you did in the original map, and it'll tell you if your JSON is valid. It won't let you just submit whatever you want in that, that box. They don't want you corrupting your map or anything like that. Um, but you just have to make sure that, you know, as long as the map structure is identical with identical uh, layer names and everything, you should be able to just copy and paste, super easy. Um, saves a bunch of time um, and a bunch of clicks. So there are a couple other ways uh, you can use this. For example, on uh, Tuesday afternoon, they we had one service and a map that we were like, we're going to have to republish this. I was like, I just finished building a smart form for this. Um, I don't want to have to do that again. So I just go in there, copy out the smart form, have it stored in a text file on my computer. As soon as they republish and it's ready to be put back into the map, I can go ahead and just paste that back in and not have to reduplicate all that work. But, yep, I think that's, try to keep it quick, but uh, if you have any questions, just let me know. And thank you. That was a very valuable little trick I just learned. Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. So, Amy Axon with Department of Environmental Quality, Division Waste, Waste Management. <laughs> Hi, all. Thank you all for hanging in there with us. Um, so, Melanie is from my same department, but I'm in the Division of Waste Management. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a slight problem we had and a solution that we came up uh, with to address the problem. Um, our division is fairly diverse. We have five sections and we, we issue permits for um, different types of sites or facilities. We monitor them for contamination 
Um, and we even inventory some of them without doing a lot of monitoring. We have, I think, over 35,000 sites, we call them. I mean, they can be facilities. They can actually be an incident, a spill of some kind um, throughout the state. And we have five or six different data stewards that manage their own data set for their own um, type of uh, program, which has a, you know, a variety of sites within them. We wanted to be able to come up with a solution to serve that data up to the public and actually to our um, internal customers too, people within our own division, within our department, so they can see where these sites are located, they can query them, uh, learn a little bit more about them. Um, and so our team, we had a team of folks, and some of them are in the room today, we worked together to build, uh, we used ArcGIS Online to host our data sets. And the, the ones I host, I manage regularly, I update regularly, they're hosted there, they're a feature layer. Um, so the nice thing is that they can be pulled into different maps and applications, and as I update them, they may, they stay that way for all of these maps and applications. So, so we host our data sets up in ArcGIS Online, and um, then we use what we call the Division of Waste Management Site Locator Tool to consolidate all of that information into one mapping application that's available to the public. And um, I'm going to kind of just step through it real quick. Um, this is the site. And uh, of course, we have to have our disclaimer that you have to click on and agree to. Um, but it looks pretty uh, innocuous now. There's not much going on. But as you zoom in, you will see our um, 35,000 plus sites pop up and it gets quite crowded and crazy. Uh, so we have ways in which people can search this, this mapping application and uh, find out what's going on maybe in their neighborhood or if it's a consulting firm they want to know maybe what's around this, a particular site. There's different ways to do that. We first have um, a little information page here that kind of walks people through how to use it. Um, but also I'm just going to consolidate that and um, go in to show you. Um, first of all, our legend, we have 20 different data sets, as I mentioned, um, consolidated on this one particular map, representing different types of sites within that our division is interested in. Our um, layer list, uh, list of sites, but one of the nice things is if you're particularly interested in one of these layers, you can um, you know, go to the attribute table to just see those those sites within that attribute table, or you can read about each individual um, layer through the di item details page. We've uh, configured it so that you can come in here and if you have a particular um, address you want to go to, or um, let's say, I think we're near Sherry, uh, I think it's Street, are we Cherry Street in Winston-Salem? I forget exactly where we are. There we go, kind of near here. You can zoom in to that area. Obviously, there's a lot going on. It's an urban area. Um, but you could also, if you are concerned about a particular site itself, you can, we've programmed the, the search uh, tool to be able to pull up a site based on its name or ID. But um, as you can see in this area, I'm not sure where we are exactly, but you, there's a lot of different things going on here. And you can click on these individual icons um, and read about the, the, um, the particular site. This is an underground storage tank facility. Um, one of the things that was really important to us as a division was that we had um, several years back con gone, converted over to a um, online document management system. We use LaserFish. So all of our, you know, back in the day we had all these paper files um, and people would have to come into the, uh, you know, make an appointment with the file room and pull up information about the site, um, the the site, and you know, go in physically look at it. But we've we've linked to um, the online management system here, which is very nice. Um, so if you want to um, go look at the project file itself, there's a link, and it will pull up the files. That takes a little time. I'm not going to waste time with it since I only have one minute. The other only, only other tool I wanted to show you was that we also created uh, using the, the screening widget, which I love. Um, there are a lot of people that want to know um, what's within certain proximity to an area of interest for them. 
Um, and so you can, we just program this to be able to say, oh, I want to drop a point, I live here, and I want to look within a mile of where I live and see um, what's going on in that area. It will draw a circle around that point, ooh, that's a big area, um, and give you a summary of all the different types of sites in that proximity, and then you can also generate a PDF report that includes, uh, it does take a little while to load that map. I need to, I don't know why, but it always does. And then it kind of, it also produces a summary of the different categories of sites and those that are falling within that one mile um, area. So that's a very quick overview of the application. And definitely follow up with me later if you have any questions. Thank you very much. And last, we have Saren Homer with also uh, DEQ. And I'm excited to hear about this one. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, my name is Saren Homer. Uh, I'm with the Department of Environmental Quality, the um, Division of Water Resources. Um, just as a brief quick overview of what we do. Um, so as Melanie touched on already, we do a wide breadth of um, things uh, for protecting North Carolina's drinking surface and groundwater resources. So that ranges from permitting, uh, compliance and enforcement. We do environmental emergency response, uh, monitoring and assessment, water planning, certifications, et cetera. Um, today, I'm just going to focus on uh, how uh, we specifically have been using LIDAR data in the 401 uh, in buffer permitting program and compliance and enforcement. So essentially, um, identifying and protecting permitting um, stream and wetland resources. Um, so We've been using LIDAR to evaluate potential presence of streams, wetlands, and other surface waters, which can be really helpful when we're doing permit reviews for people that want to potentially impact uh, protected streams and wetlands. Um, we also, it helps when we do um, stream and buffer determinations, so when we actually determine whether or not something would be a um, protected water, whether or not they would need a permit for that. Um, and it's also been very beneficial for uh, compliance and enforcement purposes. So if someone violates water quality standards by uh, impacting a protected water, um, it's been really helpful for evaluating those cases. Uh, so I'm just going to run through a really quick example um, of one situation where it's been really helpful to be able to utilize this data. Um, so in this example, uh, we received a referral from another state agency. Uh, in this situation, it was the Division of Land Management. They happened to be out at this property doing a sediment erosion control inspection. Uh, they found that they thought there was a potential water quality violation based on what they saw and re um, reported it to us. Uh, to go do an evaluation. Um, so once they reported all of that information to us, the location, um, they were concerned that potentially uh, streams and wetlands had been graded and completely buried by this project. Um, and so we were able to utilize the spatial data download, um, which is uh, really uh, a pretty precise and um, high quality LIDAR data that's available to the public. Um, and we're able to, you can zoom in on your area and download tiles uh, for that area. And we can do a preliminary desktop review in ArcGIS Pro by pulling in that data and manipulating the symbology in order to really uh, zoom in on very subtle changes in elevation. And it's precise enough that we're able to actually distinguish the actual location of channels. Um, which can be very helpful when someone has buried a channel and you can no longer see it when you're actually in the field. So this is just a quick screenshot of the example site. Uh, this is the digital elevation modeling data uh, that was pulled in for this property. And uh, we were able to just draw in using shapefiles 
um, the potential locations of uh, those surface waters that might have been impacted. Uh, and the, the pink lines are just parcel lines. Um, and then we take we can take that um, those shape files and they can be imported into our ArcGIS Online web maps, which we will then utilize in the field maps application when we go out in the field to do our uh, field investigation. Um, so, like I said, we'll import those layers, and then this is just a screenshot of um, the field maps application. So, um, it has those shape files that were drawn in using the LIDAR data, and you can see in real time where you're standing um, on top of the, the site and the imported layers. And so this, is, this was very helpful in this situation, as maybe you can see from this screenshot that the whole thing had been, had been buried. So if we hadn't had this data available, we would not have been able to identify where that stream potentially was. <laughs> Uh, beforehand, and so that's um, been incredibly helpful to be able to do these sorts of assessments. Um, we can also use the Field Maps app to collect data on those uh, points. So in this in this case, I collected points on where culverts had been installed um, unauthorized or where potential wetlands were, sort of do a delineation of that. Um, and that's really helpful when we have to come back and do assessments for potential enforcement or uh, civil uh, penalty assessments. And so after we have this, the data that we collect from the Field Maps app, which is automatically uploaded to ArcGIS Online, uh, we can come back and actually create maps um, to do our assessments. And so this is just a uh, quick example of a map that we were able to make based on the combination of that LIDAR data, the Field Maps data we created in the field, um, and other available uh, information in order to create this map. Um, and it, it helps from a legal standpoint as well um, when there's any discrepancies between the potential violator and the state um, and having actual evidence and GPS locations um, of these violations. Um, and we're still in the pretty early stages of using this data and other GIS technology within our division. Um, honestly, there are, as Melody had mentioned, not a ton of people in our division that are super savvy with uh, GIS. So we're still, Melanie has been doing a ton of work trying to help everybody in our division uh, get up to speed with GIS and really bring us into the 21st century with, <laughs> with GIS technology. Um, and so we have a lot of potential room for growth um, and uh, using this G LIDAR data and GIS tools in the division. Um, a few things we've been exploring recently are using uh, other more precise GIS technologies such as the Bad Elf um, GPS devices, um, more widespread utilization of the field maps application throughout the division with our field staff. Um, we'd really like to increase uh, the accessibility of data and service, services internally as well as um, interagency correspondence and um, transparency in correspondence with the public. Um, and we would like to be able to figure out a way to utilize this, uh, the precise three to five foot DEM data actually in the field maps application. At this time, it can only be used it, in our system at least with ArcGIS Pro. Um, and so it has to be sort of, uh, you have to draw the, the features in and then pull it in. So we're trying to figure out a way that we can see the live, the live data um, and uh, utilize that across the state. Um, thank you.